The Silver Crown by Robert C. O'Brien, Chapter 15 of The Stranger Returns. Mr. Carver said to King, Stay, and pointed to the trunk of a big tree. King crouched under the tree and did not move. They could hear a noisy rattling of bushes along the path leading to the cabin. Whoever was approaching was beating them as he came, the way a hunter fleshes game. Then the noise stopped. The visitor had seen the cabin itself, and in another minute he stood facing Mr. Carver outside the window. It was the stranger. He wasted no words. "'Where are the children?' he said, his voice grated like a steel rasp. He did not pretend to be friendly. "'Who are you?' said Mr. Carver. He did not sound particularly cordial either. "'Where are the children?' the stranger repeated. "'What children?' said Mr. Carver. "'Don't play games,' said the stranger. "'I know they came this way. I saw their tracks.' "'What you saw and what you know are of no interest to me,' said Mr. Carver coolly. "'If you would like to tell me who you are and what you want and why, I will listen if you make it brief. "'Otherwise I have nothing to say to you but this. You are trespassing on my land. "'Get off and get off now.' "'The stranger's hand snapped from beneath his coat, and the blue barrel of a pistol pointed at Mr. Carver's chest. "'Open the door to the cabin,' he said. "'I am going to find them and take them with me. "'If you try to stop me, I will kill you.' "'Mr. Carver did not move but said two words, King! God! There was a blurred streak of brown fur, and the stranger was on his back with two huge forepaws on his chest. The big jaws, bared teeth were an inch from his throat. King was not growling now. He was absolutely silent. As the stranger went down, his gun clattered to the ground. It lay inches from his hand. I warn you, Mr. Carver said. Do not move a muscle. I have only to say one word, and you will never move again. And he walked over, picked up the gun, flicked it open, threw away the bullets, and tossed it, tossed it in the cabin window. Now, said Mr. Carver, the dog and I will escort you to the road. You will walk back down the mountain where you came from. Do not attempt to return. We can see the road from here, and the dog will be watching for you. He will not let you pass. Mr. Carver snapped his fingers, and King came to heel. Without a word, the stranger stood up turned his back and walked down the path with the dog and Mr. Carver following. Ellen sighed with relief. "'What a dog!' whispered Otto. "'That man nearly killed Mr. Carver,' Ellen said. "'Yes, but we've got his gun now. Anyway, Mr. Carver wasn't scared a bit. Well, I was. I wasn't,' Otto said, and Ellen saw that he had the, his knife in his hand. He'd never have got through the door. "'I forgot about the knife,' Ellen said. "'Still, I'm glad he didn't try to come in. It would be awful if you had to throw it at somebody. Better than getting shot.' I suppose so, but he wasn't going to shoot us. He said he was going to take us with him. I wonder where. To their hideout. What hideout? I think Mr. Gates and that stranger are gangsters. I bet there are others in, the, in with them, too. They want to kidnap you and take you to their hideout. But why? Because they want the crown. That's why. It's probably worth a lot of money. Shh, Ellen said. Mr. Carver's coming back. We can tell him about it. I guess we could, but why should we? There's no reason to. Mr. Carver came into the cabin alone. I left King down by the road, he said, to see your friend out of sight and make sure he keeps going in the right direction. He picked up the gun from the floor of the cabin, aimed it out the window, clicked the trigger to make sure it was empty, and then laid it on a shelf. An ugly weapon, he said, and an ugly man. But he certainly proved your story. He was looking for you. No doubt about that any more. And from the way he acted, he meant you no good. Otto thinks he's trying to kidnap us. Probably for ransom, Otto lied quickly. Her aunt's rich. That's possible, Mr. Carver admitted, but still it's puzzling. How would he know about your aunt? How would he even know you have an aunt? You forget, Ellen said, I told Mr. Gates. We think they're working together. But you didn't tell Mr. Gates until after you were in his car. Why did he ask you to ride in the first place? I don't know, Ellen said, but they must have found out somehow. Maybe they hired a private eye, Otto said. And he put a bug in your house. They do that all the time in detective stories. There's not much use in trying to guess, said Mr. Carver. The point is, somebody really is trying to catch you. You need to get over the mountains and find your aunt. And then, she will probably want to go to the police. King and I can't guard the road forever, but we can't guard it for the next few days. And by that time, you'll be there. But you should keep moving steadily and reasonably fast. "'How much farther is it before we reach the highway?' Ellen asked. "'I don't know exactly, because I've never been that way, "'but I think this cabin is about the halfway mark, "'and I know the road goes over one more high pass, "'higher, I've heard, than any you've come over so far.' "'So we ought to be there in two more days,' Ellen said. 
Yes, but to be safe, I'll watch the road for four. Mr. Carver looked out the window. Anyway, it's too late for you to start again. Today, it will be dark soon. You can keep, you can spend the night here and leave tomorrow at dawn. And when you go, I think King and I will camp right by the roadside for the next four days and nights. If they come after you again, they're almost certain to come this way. For one thing, they'll think you may still be in the cabin. And if you're not, they'll know you must have gone on along the road, since there isn't any other. So Ellen and Otto ate another meal with Mr. Carver, and when it was over, talked some more about wood sculpture. Mr. Carver showed Otto how to use one of his small razor-sharp knives. Otto's own hunting knife, he said, was too big and clumsy. Under his direction, Otto succeeded in making a small but respectable wooden cat. Its eyes turned out quite slanted and evil-looking. That's not the way I wanted them to look, Otto complained. Mr. Carver laughed. That's what I meant about wood having a mind of its own. And he gave Otto the knife to keep. The children made pallets on the floor of the cabin, and they all went to sleep. Ellen woke up frequently, for the floor was hard, and several times she heard the footsteps of the dog, King, as he walked around the cabin, checking to make sure all was quiet before returning on his vigil to the road. He was a conscientious dog. They were up by dawn the next morning. A feeling of urgency had settled over all of them during the night. Mr. Carver had ridden first and had cooked and eaten breakfast while Ellen and Otto still slept. Then, while they ate, he made several trips down to the road. As they packed and shouldered their rucksacks, he returned from the last of these, and they walked down the path together. Mr. Carver had established a sentry post behind the road, hidden behind some bushes so that anyone approaching would not see it. He had brought down a chair and a sleeping bag. Against a tree near the chair leaned a long-barreled hunting rifle. About a hundred yards up the road, he had also set up an alarm system, ingenious in its simplicity. Across the road, at knee height, he had stretched a piece of thin black thread. It was hard to see even in the daylight, and it would be completely invisible at night. One end was tied to a tree, the other to an iron pail, placed on a long stone, on a large stone. Anyone who came up the road at night would inevitably knock the pail over with a loud clang. One would think that such elaborate precautions would have been reassuring to Ellen and Otto, but the truth was... They had just the opposite effect. The rifle particularly seemed ominous. Mr. Carver was evidently taking this very, very seriously. He was now convinced the danger to them was urgent and grave. The children felt the need to be gone quickly, but first they said goodbye to Mr. Carver and thanked him, and Ellen could not refrain from asking one more question. Those two statues in, those, in your cabin, the two faces, who are they? I made them about two years ago, because I discovered, though I could hardly believe it, that I was forgetting, beginning to forget what their faces looked like, yet remembering the way they looked is one of the things I enjoy most. So before the memory grew even mistier, I carved the statues. One is Eliza, the other is my wife. Some day, he added, I would like to carve your face too when you're safe again and with your aunt. Come back and visit me. I will, said Ellen. I will too, said Otto. They walked briskly down the dirt road, heading for the highest pass. As they reached the first bend, Ellen looked back. She saw that Mr. Carver had seated himself in the chair facing the other way, and King was sitting beside him.